Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you may be listening to this webinar. Today we will present to you Delaware's business entity laws, and our instructor today will be Tamara Kling. Tamara has been a government relations and regional attorney for, with CT for over 10 years. She works with state bar associations and government offices to implement changes in the business entity laws. Tamara lectures on topics related to business entity operations and filings. Along with other CT attorneys, Ms. Kling is responsible for maintaining a national database of business entity filing requirements. Tamara is licensed to practice in law in U Illinois, and she received her BA in political science from Loyola University of Chicago and her JD from Chicago Kent College of Law. And right now I'd like to introduce to you Tamara Kling. Thank you, Victor. Well, I'm going to go on. You have seen the information on housekeeping. And we're going to start the webinar today. As Victor mentioned, I have been with CT for quite a while, and I've talked on various business entity and law topics. Today we're going to talk about Delaware business entity laws. This webinar has also been referred to as Why Delaware? We all know that a lot of corporations and LLCs are are headquartered or they're domiciled in Delaware, even though they may have no real connection to the state. And today we're going to talk about all the reasons that businesses like to form in Delaware. And then we're also going to talk about Delaware's a little bit more in depth about some of their corporation and LLC laws. So today is, this is the overview. Why do companies want to form in Delaware? We'll look at the business entity laws. Um, we'll also try to get to the alternative entities. I don't know if we will. There's a lot of material here. So you will be able to get all the information on it, and I will try to cover as much as possible. You can also ask questions. What we do is we, we put all the questions together, and then as part of our thank you package to you, you will see all the questions people have asked and our answers. So that can be a helpful learning tool as well. So why is Delaware the leading formation state? This is a picture of Chicago. I live in Chicago. Perhaps that's why Victor put it here. I was expecting a picture of Delaware. All right. Well, this just gives you an idea of how new entities have been formed over the years. And as you can see, with the exception of 09, everything has just been increasing. And here we are, we've got the 2018 numbers. The 2019 are not quite yet available, but we'll have them. Another interesting thing that you can see is that the formation of LLCs has outpaced the formation of corporations, even as far back as 2008. So there were 160,000 LLCs formed and only about 45,600 corporations. So that's just something to keep in mind as we discuss things. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was there. Okay. So here we have um, just an idea of what the Delaware Corporation and alternative entities are on file. That's kind of interesting too, and it just shows you what's going on in Delaware. And as you can see, there wasn't even a dip in 09. It was just flat. And then by 2010, things started to increase again. And Delaware corporations and entities are also just a good barometer of what's happening in the economy overall. So we are at polling question number one. Oh, thank you, Pamela. We're at polling question number one. And please enter these for CLE credit. Um, answer in the pop-up box that comes up on your screen, not in the Q&A box. That's for questions about the webinar itself. But here we are with polling question number one. Where do you form the majority of your entities? Is it number one, Delaware? Is it two, the state where I practice, or three, elsewhere? And again, this is for CLE credit. These need to be answered. Um, and answer in the pop-up box that just came up on your screen, not the Q&A box. And we have polling question one. Where do you form the majority of your entities? Is it number one, Delaware? Is it number two, the state where I practice? Or perhaps three? And one last time, just to make sure everybody gets uh, time to answer the question. Where do you form a majority of your entities? Number one, Delaware. Number two, the state where I practice. And number three, elsewhere. All right, I think everybody had a good chance here to 
react to the poll, and I'm going to send the results to you, Tamara, and you'll see that we have uh, 62% of the people have actually formed the majority of their entities. Okay. Well, you are here for a very good reason. Uh, and if you form in the state where you practice, that can make a lot of sense too, especially if you have a smaller business. If you have a smaller business, it's hard to tell your client, well, we're going to form you as a Delaware LLC, and then, oh yeah, you're going to have to qualify and pay to do business in the state where you live and work. So that can be a hard sell sometimes. And then elsewhere, I'm thinking that's probably Nevada. So why do so many businesses form in Delaware? I'll go into all of this in a little bit more detail, but the Delaware business entity statutes are, are helpful. They're well, world, they're well written, they're available, and they're, they, send, they tend to promote corporate and business welfare. The court system is excellent, and the court system has generated a large body of case law. And then also, as a practical matter, there's the division of corporations that does all the business entity filings. So there's a lot of words that practitioners and other people have used to describe the Delaware statutes. They look at them as very modern. They're updated almost annually. They tend to be flexible with the LLC. They understand that it's a pick-your-partner entity, and they try to accommodate that. They tend to be non-restrictive, especially you'll see that with the LLCs, efficient and predictable. And all of these things make them attractive to practitioners. The guiding principles of the business entity law want to allow management to act quickly. They respect the freedom to contract, especially with LLCs. There's a strong bias against regulation. These are not regulatory statutes. The LLC and the corporation requirements are generally what you need to get a business on the record. And we're going to go in more in depth about shareholders' derivative suits, um, directors and officers' liability, things of that nature. It is covered. It's not a, a complete free-for-all. And the laws are adaptable to new developments, both in the law, in business, and in technology. So there can be a lot of reasons for the uh, Delaware legislature to seek to make updates. There can be changes in the business environment. There can be new lending practices. There can be other types of insurance that become available, technology, all kinds of changes. Uh, for instance, it's been a long time since directors were required to vote in person. They can do that through technology, and, and why shouldn't they be able to do that? The process is that the annual amendments to the Delaware Code are drafted by the Delaware Bar Association's Corporation Law Council. Now, they seek input from around the country, from uh, professors, managers, people who are very well versed in business entity law, investors, people of all stripes. They also receive requests from the Secretary of State. They see what's going on, and the Secretary of State often has good ideas as well. It's then enacted like the, by the legislature, like any other act. Um, I don't want you to think it's a complete rubber stamp, though. The Delaware legislature also takes these things seriously, and they debate and look into it and take comment as well. So here's one of the cases that I think you'll find interesting. Um, it's an example of the state legislature uh, re reacting to a court decision. And in this case, it was called ATP Tour versus the Deutsche Tennisbund. And the issue was, is a bylaw adopted by the board which shifted attorney fees to unsuccessful plaintiffs in intra-corporate litigation valid. So in other words, loser pays, uh, especially if it's the plaintiff. And it's to, it's to, chill, it's to chill litigation. Um, and the Delaware Supreme Court held, yes, it's valid. There is no provision in the corporate code or any other Delaware law that would prohibit it. Um, it's enforceable, and they said that the intention may be to deter challenges to their corporate actions, as that, that is not an improper purpose. So given the law as it stood, it was okay. Um, but this led to an amendment. The Delaware legislature made changes which prohibited a bylaw or any kind of a charter provision 
from imposing on a stockholder for attorney fees or expenses of the corporation or any other party in connection with an internal corporate claim. So they did not want to discourage corporate claims to a large degree. This is just a picture of the Delaware court system. This actually comes from the Delaware website. They, re they refer to the Supreme Court of Delaware as the court of last resort. As you'll notice with the court of chancery, that's where most business law cases go. It's an equitable and a law court. So the court of chancery is the court that hears most cases revolving around Delaware business law. So there's three ways to get to chancery court. You can have an equitable claim. You can be seeking an equitable remedy. Or you can have a statute that provides jurisdiction. And all of the business entity statutes do confer jurisdiction on the chancery court. The chancery court judges are picked carefully. They have a lot of knowledge. And they're very highly regarded in the business law world. So this is a case to kind of underscores how badly litigation litigants want to be in the Chancery Court. In this case, the plaintiff had lost money entrusted to Bernie Madoff, and they filed a suit in the Chancery Court. They wanted an equitable apportionment of the defense costs between the bond underwriters and the director and officer insurer. So this was um, they were seeking apportionment of costs between basically insurance companies. All the litigants, plaintiff and defendant, wanted the case heard by the Chancery Court. But the Chancery Court looked at this case and raised their own subject matter jurisdiction, and they said they did not have jurisdiction. They lacked jurisdiction because what they essentially said was this is really just a contract matter. Um, they're claiming that the defendants didn't fulfill their obligations under those insurance, com insurance policies, which are contracts. So this is a breach of contract, it's an action for damages, and it does not belong in the Court of Chancery. There's really nothing equitable about it. There's also something called the Forum Selective Clause, Selection Clause, and it authorizes forum selection provisions in a corporation certificate of incorporation or bylaws. So when you're forming a corporation, you may want to have all internal claims be brought before the Delaware Chancery Court. Maybe you have stockholders who live in other states, or, or there may be other ways of doing that. Um, so it prohibits any provision in the certificate of incorporation that prohibits bringing an internal corporate claim in Delaware. For some reason, maybe people want to stay out of Delaware. And the internal claim is defined as a claim, including a shareholder's derivative action, that's based on a violation of the duty by a director or officer um, as to which the general corporation law confers jurisdiction upon the chancery court. In addition to that, there's a lot of reasons businesses like it. The Supreme Court has great expertise. They hear cases fairly quickly, and they're thorough. If you ever see some of their decisions, they can be 40, 50, or 60 pages long. So there's a lot of information they give, not only in their analysis of the case and the law, but sometimes there's dicta as well that can be helpful. And they tend to be flexible, and they really do try to be consistent. And that goes back to the jurists on the court being very dedicated and knowledgeable. Delaware, this court, has generated a lot of case law, um, the largest body of corporate case law in the country. Um, almost every section of the code has been interpreted at some point. And there's a lot of precedent. There's a lot of case law on things like director and officer liability, shareholder derivative suits, antitrust takeover defenses, uh, merger fairness, fiduciary duty. So there is a whole lot there. And over time, the LLC case law has developed as well. So there are a lot of LLC cases. For a while, that was one of the reasons some practitioners were reluctant to form LLCs. But the truth is, there's a lot of guidance from the court. Then lastly, we have the Division of Corporations. Uh, that's part of the Secretary of State's office. They process all the business entity filings. They are the official maintainer of records. And as far as Delaware, what the most important thing for the state is, 
they assess and collect franchise taxes. Now, Delaware does not have sales tax. They are modern. They're technologically advanced. Um, filings can be completed in as quickly as half an hour. And this also generates a big chunk of the state's revenue. So that's one of the reasons that this is so important to the state. They do understand the needs of the community of users, so they meet with some of the large law firms and the service companies such as CT. So they understand that our role is to make their business easier. This just gives you an idea of they allow expedited service and cutoff times. So as you can see, there's some pretty generous things such as um, you know, one hour service for $1,000. Now that's pretty expensive, but if you have a large closing, if you're, sh you're selling a huge commercial building, you don't want the closing to be held up, you may be able to avail yourself to this. So this can be very important. The state forms aren't mandatory. You can create whatever you want. Only one, doc, one document copy, copy is required. And if you make an error, there are some articles of correction that can be filed. If the document was inaccurate, if there's a defective execution, um, and the effective date is the same as the document originally filed unless people can say that they relied on your inaccurate filing to their detriment. And you can have a delayed effective date, um, 90 days for corporations, 100 days, 180 days for different entity types. So this gives you all kind of time that if you do not wish to pay for expedited filing and you want a certain filing time, then this is what I would recommend. Documents, of course, have to be signed. Signatures are easy. They can be conformed, electronic, or facsimile. Generally, a corporation document can be signed by any officer, and an LLC can be so signed by an authorized person. So the person signing the document does not have to be a member or manager. Um, and then with some of the other partnership agreements, you can see what the requirements are. Document ordering, that's very important. What if you need a certificate of good standing? Well, they have long form and short form. Maybe you need to get a loan, and the loan officer needs to make sure that this corporation is in good standing in their home state. That makes sense. Um, you can also have certified copies if a merger has taken place. Um, and there is also expedited and standard service for that, too. So maybe you need something. Um, you, maybe you have a, back to a closing, and one of the parties needs to show that they are in good standing in their home state. You would do an expedited document ordering if necessary. So now we are at the second polling question. Thank you very much, Tamara. Polling question number two, it sort of addresses what Tamara has been speaking about. Which factor do you believe is most responsible for Delaware's popularity as a formation state? And your choices are number one, it's business entity statutes. Number two, it's court system. Number three, it's extensive case law precedent. Number four, it's filing office. Or number five, all of the above. And again, please answer in the pop-up box that comes up on your screen. These are for CLE credit. Do not answer in the Q&A box, but in the pop-up box that came up. And we'll do it again, polling question number two. Which factor do you believe is the most responsible for Delaware's popularity as a formation state? Is it number one, it's business entity statutes. Number two, it's court system. Number three, it's extensive case law precedent. Number four, it's filing office, or number five, all of the above. And one last time, just to make sure everybody has time here because I uh, don't want to miss anybody for CLE credit, which factor do you believe is the most responsible for Delaware's popularity as a formation state? One, it's business entity statutes. Two, it's court system. Three, it's extensive case law precedent. Four, it's filing office. And number five, all of the above. And I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to push the results to you, Tamara. And I think you'll see that uh, everyone, got, well, the vast majority got this pretty much all right, that uh, it's really all of the above. I think you're right. Um, or you could just call it the Delaware mystique. Mm -hmm. Clients are also familiar with it, or at least they know Delaware is an important state, so that's part of it as well. All right, so no surprise there. 
So we're going to take a look at Delaware corporate law. Just briefly, um, it, was in it was an 1899 law, but in 2013, New Jersey passed some antitrust laws, and a lot of businesses took their business to Delaware. They went across the river. Um, publicly traded Delaware corps are subject to the federal securities law. Um, traditionally, federal law didn't govern the internal operations of corporations. But with history, um, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, and there have been other federal regulatory um, bodies or governing of the internal affairs of corporations. So there's several things to look at. Formation, stockholders. Delaware tends to define things or use different terms. Usually you'll hear shareholder, and Delaware, they are called stockholders. It's the same thing. So we're going to go into Delaware corporate law. There are several steps when you're forming a corporation. Um, you have to prepare and file a certificate of incorporation. You need to protect the name. Clients don't understand sometimes that if the name isn't available, they don't understand why their own name may not be available. So just as a practical tip, if they're looking into signage and all, all kinds of things, make sure the name is available first before they take it too far. They have to hold an organizational meeting, elect directors, adopt bylaws, and issuance of stock. This is kind of an interesting case, uh, Schiabucci versus Salzburg. And here we have kind of the limits on the certificate of incorporation clauses. Um, corporations have had form selection clauses purporting to require any claim under the Securities Act of 1933 has to be brought in federal court. Now that makes sense to me. It's a federal act. You would go to federal court. Um, but the clause was invalid and ineffective as it sought to bind the plaintiff to a particular form where the claim does not involve the rights or relationships that were established by or under Delaware corporation law. So the Delaware Chancery Court awarded a fee of $3 million to the attorneys of the shareholder plaintiff who successfully challenged the Securities Act of 1933 to be brought in federal court. Um, the plaintiff achieved a significant result in the attorneys developed an advanced and nuanced public policy argument. Um, and so this has been kind of a complicated area, and it's a very recent case if you would like to read it. It gives you a lot of insight, not into this just specific issue, but how the court analyzes things. Incorporation fees, you have to pay these different fees. Um, reduced or lower fees is not the reason corporations incorporate in Delaware. There are certain fees. And here has the filing fee table based on whether you have stock without par value or par value stock. Also, you have to have meetings for the stockholders. They have to have their annual meeting. Uh, special meetings can be held by the board or any authorized person. And meetings can be held by means of remote communication. This is particularly important to smaller businesses who don't want to have to meet in person can save a lot of money. Action can also be taken by consent without having a meeting, a notice, or a vote. The voting requirements can be the same as you would have for a meeting. You can also deny this in the certificate of incorporation. Maybe you want to have some kind of debate or discussion. You don't want everyone just signing a form. But the election of directors requires unanimous consent. So what this means is if you are going to have action taken by consent, just by signing forms or agreeing, it does not require a majority generally unless it's related to directors. So that, that kind of gives you a little insight into the popularity and, and why Delaware is so liked. Um, the default provision is that each share has a vote, um, but also you can have classes or series of shares that have greater, lesser, no voting rights. You can have stock that votes double, you know, you can have stock that's preferred, stock that's paid more. There's a whole lot of things that you can do, especially if you have preferred stockholders or certain investors. Cumulative voting can be authorized. What that means is that if you have 100 shares, 
and there are several voters, you can, uh, several directors, you can accumulate your votes to vote that way. Um, most voting in a publicly traded company would be done by proxy. I don't know if you've ever owned shares in a public company, but you used to get that big package in the mail and that you could read it and decide how you wanted to vote, to whom you want to give your proxy vote. And some people find that very interesting and get quite involved. Dividends. That's important. Um, they're payable only if declared by the board, and the board is never required to pay a dividend. It can reinvest it. Um, if you are going to pay a dividend, there are certain accounting procedures, and according to the Delaware Code, they have to be paid out of what's called surplus or net profit. Stockholder approval is never needed for a dividend distribution. Also, stockholders have the right to inspect books and records. Um, they have to make a written demand, and they have to show that there's some kind of proper purpose. You can't just get stock, you can't just get a list of shareholders to send out advertising or some other reason unrelated to the corporation. And the burden of proof um, for the proper purpose, if you're looking to have the stockholder list, then the corporation has to show that the stockholder has does not have a proper purpose. With other records, the burden shifts to the stockholder, and they have the primary responsibility of saying that they have a proper purpose. So this is a case called Weingarten versus Monster Worldwide. And in this case, you have a plaintiff that demanded a corporate on the corporation that it have the right to inspect its records. The plaintiff was a stockholder at the time, but the corporation refused the demand. They had their reasons. Um, the corporation was subsequently acquired, and the plaintiff was no longer a stockholder when they filed the action. So the court was presented with the issue of first impression. Does a plaintiff seeking to inspect corporate records, um, do they have to be a stockholder at the time the plaintiff files the complaint? Remember, the corporation changed hands. Um, and the court said the plaintiff has to demonstrate that they have complied with the requirements for inspection. And part of that is that you have to be a stockholder. The legislation they said was very clear. Um, only stockholders at the time of the filing have standing to invoke the, court, invoke the court's assistance. So no, they did not have a case. Another thing that comes up quite a bit is shareholder derivative suits. And for that, contemporaneous ownership is required according to the procedural rules, and derivative suits are governed by the Chancery Court rule and by case law. The demand even has to be excused if futile, and the plaintiff has to have adequate representative. The plaintiff must be an adequate representative of the other parties that they are claiming are seeking to have their um, issues addressed under the derivative suit. So demand can be excused. Um, demand is excused when the facts allege the board's decision is not entitled to the protection of the business judgment rule. Now the business judgment rule, we hear that a lot, it's derived from case law. And it presumes in making a decision, the directors acted in an informed basis, in good faith, with an honest belief that their action taken was in the best interest of the corporation. Um, you can only rebut that the directors breached that fiduciary duty uh, by doing it by saying they breached their duty of good faith, loyalty, or due care. So the purpose of the demand requirement gives the corporation the ability to rectify or change something prior to litigation. The theory is that we want the shareholders to make a demand on the board to tell them what they should do and give the directors the opportunity to say, well, yeah, maybe we should. Maybe that we're going in the wrong direction. Um, the board of directors manages the business affairs of the company. You can have one or more. Um, the default or the general rule is the term is one year unless staggered. Um, and a director can be removed either by a majority vote of the stockholder not a supermajority, just a more majority, and it can be removed by the chancery court. So if the shareholders take the corporation to court and say this director is 
uh, breached his fiduciary duties or he's somehow incompetent, then that Chancery Court can elect to choose, choose to get rid of one of your directors. Directors are elected by a plurality of the votes. The stockholders, again, vote for the director. Um, the director with the most votes is elected without regard um, to votes withheld or not cast. Or who or voted against, and that's because there's, you know, there could be 20,000 stockholders, and maybe only a small percentage vote for the directors, or they can have what's called a plurality plus. Um, you have to adopt that bylaw, and that requires the director receiving less than a majority of votes has to resign, um, and it may then give the board the discretion to reject the resignation. Then directors have fiduciary duties, um, and this is defined by case law, not the corporate law, and they owe a duty of loyalty. They cannot be on two sides of the same transaction. They are not allowed to compete with the corporation, and then we have to look at the corporate opportunity doctrine. Now, this doctrine says that the director, officer, and or controlling shareholders can't take a business opportunity that could benefit the corporation. And it's really what we consider it to be is an application of the fiduciary duty of loyalty. Um, so they also owe a duty of care. And the actions, again, as I just mentioned, are protected by the business judgment rule. This is kind of an interesting case, too, called Marchand versus Barnhill. Um, and in do, it involves the director's Caremark's duty of oversight. And I'll go into that a little bit. Caremark was a case that was decided in 1996 in Delaware. It was a derivative suit. And the Delaware court said the corporation had um, the authority to establish and had the duty to establish an oversight process. But it also had the duty to monitor that. Just setting up an oversight process wasn't enough. Um, and they said in this case, um, the board in Caremark failed to establish oversight procedures for, you can hear the air quotes here, mission critical functions. Um, and if they did not do that or failed to follow through, then they can be held liable for breach of Caremark's duties. So that's, that's what the Caremark duties are. Now in this case, there was an ice cream company that had a listeria outbreak. They had to recall the product, they shut down, and there was stock dilution. So it was very harmful to this company. Um, a stockholder, however, filed a derivative suit, and it claimed that the directors ignored a lot of red flags. So there was a violation of Caremark. But the trial court dismissed this complaint, um, and the Delaware Supreme Court reversed. It held that dismissing the stockholder Caremark claim was improper. He had pleaded facts supporting a fair inference that no reasonable compliance system and protocols were established. Um, the board of directors lacked any kind of effort, um, that resulted in not receiving official notice notices from food safety, and they really took they really um, failed to take a remedial action and expose the consumers to a lot of harm. So you know, listeria is serious and any kind of food company should be prepared for that. And in this case, they did not make their care mark duty. Um, and then the court went in to say there's a lot of evidence the board's failures. And here are some of them. Um, no board, there was no board committee that addressed food safety. That's important. You should, with a food company, you should probably have a committee that's devoted to food safety. Um, there weren't any kind of processes or protocols that required management to keep the board appraised of food safety issues. Um, no schedule for the board to consider um, quarterly or any kind of food safety. So as you, you can hear the word food safety comes up a lot. And depending on the corporation and the business they're in, that care mic duty might be looked at differently. Um, and you can read, I don't want to read everything to you, but uh, the board meetings are devoid of any suggestion that there was any regular discussion of food safety issues. So 
food safety is mission critical to an ice cream company, and they failed to meet that duty. Officers, it's another thing that will, something you need to know about Delaware corporate law. Um, the titles and duties are stated in the bylaws or by resolution. Uh, any number of offices can be held by the same person, especially if you have a smaller company. Um, the chosen is bylaws or determined by the board. And officers, it's important to remember, owe the same fiduciary duty as directors. And that was reiterated in a case in Delaware in 2009. So in case there's any doubt, officers have the same fiduciary duties as directors. Uh, the corporate charter can't limit or eliminate personal liability for breach of duty. Um, so that's something to consider. And then there's indemnification and advancement. I'll talk about this a little bit. We want good people to serve as officers and directors, and in order to do that, they don't want to be taking too many risks. So they want to know that they will be protected. Um, according to the Delaware Code, there's permissive indemnification that pays expenses, settlement agreements, but in order to avail themselves to the permissive uh, indemnification, the party needed to have acted in good faith and in the corporation's best interest. Um, indemnification isn't permitted in a derivative suit if that director, the corporate defendant, is found liable. Um, some corporations just take these provisions and make them mandatory. Something to think about with the payment of expenses, attorney's fees, you want to make sure that if you're drafting some kind of agreement for your directors, that, and they will probably insist that they have advancement of fees. Uh, lawsuits can take a long time and they can be expensive. So you want to know that the directors will be able to actually defend themselves. They won't have to be waiting for a, a settlement or for a court decision. In the statute, they tell us what kind of amendments can be made to a corporate charter, um, name, purpose, stockholders' rights, dividends, all of these things. In addition to that, if there's anything specific to your corporation or your industry, you can make changes there as well. So this is just the procedure. I'm not going to spend too much time on amendments. Um, a restated certificate of incorporation, Let's say you have a lot of amendments and you want to have one document, this will reduce your certification costs. It's called, sometimes called a bring down document. Um, one thing that's relatively new is the ratification of defective acts. Um, and that allows the board of directors to adopt a resolution um, to ratify some kind of technically defective act or something did not go the way you thought it would. Then we talk a lot about mergers. You know, corporations are free to merge with other business entity types. I, I won't read all of that to you, but we've talked about Delaware law being liberal, and this is the one of the ways that it is. There's also consolidation. Um, the Delaware Code does not authorize share exchanges. If you've taken any of our courses on mergers, it's, it's called the reverse triangular merger that would affect a share exchange. Foreign companies can domesticate to Delaware, especially if they want to do business in the United States. I'll talk a little bit about merger. Um, you know, the board adopts a resolution. They decide they want to have a merger. The shareholders vote. Um, there's also short form merger, different types of merger. Uh, you'll be able to see that in your notes. Conversion is important. This is relatively new, where a business entity can change what type of it is, a business it is, and it can move to another state. This is a huge change, so all the outstanding stock has to vote. Um, if the outstanding stock votes, file a certificate of conversion with the Secretary of State. Um, if they're going to become a new entity, such as you're converting a LLC to a corporation, then you would need articles of incorporation. Um, and other Delaware or foreign entities can convert to Delaware. Um, the approval of the other entity has to look, you have to look to their governing document. And in order to do this, you file a certificate of conversion, and if you're moving to Delaware, a certificate of incorporation. 
So we are now at polling question number three. All right, thank you so much, Tamara. We're at polling question number three, and again, this is for CLE credit. I need to answer these in order to get your certificate. And polling question number three is, in your practice, you often convert entities, that is, do you, so to speak, and your choices are number one, frequently, number two, rarely, and number three, never. And again, please answer in the pop-up box that came up on your screen for this CLE polling question. Polling question number three, in your practice, you often convert entities, one, frequently, two, rarely, or three, never. All right, uh, Tamara is sort of speaking about this, and polling question number three, I'll read one last time just to make sure everybody gets a chance to answer. And it's a quick one. Number three, in your practice, you often convert entities, number one, frequently, number two, rarely, or number three, never. All right, I'm going to close the poll. I believe everybody's answered, and I'm going to push the results to you, Tamara, and you'll see that we have... Um, rarely about 60%, never about 30%, and frequently 10 Okay, that's interesting. I want to clarify my language. Traditionally, uh, con conversions, I guess traditionally is in the eye of the beholder, but originally with conversions, if you moved from state to state, it was called a conversion. If you changed your entity type, it was a conversion. Now a lot of statutes are, a lot of states are saying that if you move to another state, they're calling it domestication. So conversion and domestication, I don't want to confuse the two, but the, the, the rules are that you can move either from state to state, change your entity type, or both. So that's just something I want people to be aware of. And if you're changing entity type from state to state, you know, for instance, you have a Kansas LP that wants to become an Ohio LLC. You have to check the Kansas LP statute, making sure it can convert to that type of entity type in another state. And then you would have to check the Ohio LLC statute to make sure that is allowed as well. So just, just to be clear, you have to check the laws of both states and for each entity type that's involved. Well, at some point, your corporation, maybe you don't want to do business anymore, you want to dissolve. Um, that has to be approved of by the board of directors and a majority of the stockholders. Again, this can be by unanimous written consent. You maybe you don't want to gather all the stockholders for a meeting to dissolve. Um, if the business hasn't even begun yet, then the incorporators or the initial director can do this. After it's been approved, you have to file a certificate of dissolution, and you have to pay all your franchise taxes that you owe the state before you are allowed. Um, so the Secretary of State would require any annual franchise tax report that's due or will be due soon to be filed before the corporation can officially dissolve. Also, Delaware allows you to revoke the dissolution within a period of three years. So maybe you decide that the corporation has merit or you wish to do things or continue doing business. Within that three-year period, you can revoke the dissolution. You don't have to reform. So that gives you the relation back. You are considered to have been in a corporation the entire time since the period of incorporation, not just the uh, you don't have to start over if you're under that three-year period. If you go past the three years, then you have to incorporate a new corporation. Public benefit corporations, these are kind of interesting. It's defined as a for-profit corporation. It's organized on the Delaware Corporate Code, and it's intended to provide some kind of benefit to the public, uh, maybe operating in a responsible, sustainable business manner. You can think of a lot of things that are environmental, charitable, um, things that just are meant to help the public. Um, so the purpose of the public benefit is that it's managed in a way that balances stockholders' interests and in the best interest of the stakeholders, anyone who would be material, uh, material affected by the corporation's conduct. Um, 
In the Certificate of Incorporation, you have to identify that it is a public benefit entity. Um, and if you already have an existing Delaware Corporation, it can become a public, and public benefit corporation if it amends uh, its Certificate of Incorporation. It can also merge into a public benefit corporation. And that must be approved by two-thirds of the outstanding shares of each class of stock. Obviously, you require some kind of a supermajority approval because it is such a huge change. Um, they also have to provide notice to the stockholders regarding their efforts to achieve that public benefit that they were formed. Um, and no appraisal rights are available if, a public, if it's publicly held. Um, so there's some examples I have for you. There's Method. That's a company that produces environmentally friendly cleaning products. It's sold at Target. There is Kickstarter, Plum Organics, a baby food, Patagonia, that's a, an older company that's been around for a long time. Um, Athleta is kind of interesting. They formed in 1998. They were ultimately became part of Gap Brands, and they became an official B Corp or public benefit corporation in 2019. So public benefit corporations are still, they, they are growing. Um, another thing, sometimes I get questions, people don't understand the difference between a public benefit corporation. You know, why would I want to have a public benefit corporation when I could have a nonprofit entity? And the biggest difference is a public benefit company can profit. You can make profits for the company. Um, but they're just allowed to make different choices based on what, they're, what they see themselves doing for the public. So they can take into account not just profit, but stakeholder liability, um, reputation, environmental considerations, who they hire. So there's a lot that goes into a public benefit corporation and it gives them a lot of latitude. Now, a nonprofit corporation, of course, can take um, donations. But a public benefit corporation, they don't accept donations, but they can probably sell you stock. So that might encourage investment. So there's a lot of interest in that. So I'm going to take a look now at the Delaware Limited Liability Company Act. Um, it's been effective since October of 1992. The first LLC Act was enacted earlier in Wyoming, but Delaware is the leading LLC state as well. Kind of interesting, it is based on the Limited Partnership Act, not the Corporation Code. It's full of mainly default provisions. So what that means is you have to be very you have to be very familiar with the default provisions because if you don't mention them in the operating agreement, which is what guides the LLC, then the default provisions will prevail if you are taken into chancery court. Um, the policy of the Act is clear. They want to give the maximum effect to the principle of the freedom to contract and the enforceability of the LLC agreement itself. Now Delaware, again, changes their language a little bit. LLC agreement, in other states you may hear it called the operating agreement. Same thing here, it's just given a different name. They're very easy to form. Uh, file a certificate of formation. There are limited requirements, and there's a $90 fee to file. They can be easily amended as well. You might want to change the name of the entity. You might want to change various things that you had on that initial formation document. So if you want to change, you can, obviously. Um, they are allowed to carry out any lawful business, purpose, or activity. Um, they may be for profit or nonprofit. Now, most states, it's pretty rare to find a nonprofit LLC, but in Delaware, that's not an issue. The statutes do prohibit them from engaging in banking. And they have all the powers that are granted by the statute and whatever is given to them in the LLC agreement. So this is what I mentioned, the operating agreement. And it's used to opt out mostly out of the default provisions. So in order to draft a good agreement, you have to know what is in the default provisions. You don't want to have 
the Chancery Court filling in the gaps. Also, an LLC agreement, it can be written, oral, or implied. So even if you don't have something in writing, it does not mean you do not have an agreement. And it is not subject to the statute of frauds. That's from a recent court case. These are some of the typical things you might want to include in your LLC agreement. Um, meetings, terms of existence. A big one is always allocation of profits and loss. How will new members be admitted? Do you want to sell membership interests? That's important. Funding, that's always important. Those are things to think about. So, as I've mentioned, there's fewer default provisions, so you have to be aware of that. Um, draft carefully, and um, issues including the place and time of meetings, quorum, any of this stuff, you'll have to put in. It's common in the corporation law, but it is not common in Delaware, it's not there in Delaware LLC law. And depending upon what kind of LLC you want to have, are you a pharmaceutical company? Are you a few friends getting together to form a small business? There's a lot of things to consider. So an LLC can be a single member. Delaware and all states allow that. I'm going to go on a little bit so we don't miss our polling question. Um, this is an interesting case. Um, I saw one heading for it, and it was kind of clickbait for attorneys. The, the headline was, Chancery Court Denies Records and Family Feud Over $950 Million Sale. So what we have here is the St. Gervais LLC was formed to pass wealth on from one family, from a couple, to their daughters. Um, as an assignee of a membership interest, uh, the assignee had no right to inspect the books and records and she wanted to do so. Um, and here they said the trust settler's assignment of her LLC interest had no effect because dispositions without prior written unanimous consent of LLC managers were null and void, meaning that the trust had no interest in the LLC. So the contractual language was such that the acts were void. It trumped the common law, rendering of the settler's assignment ineffective and invulnerable to equitable defenses. Talk a little bit about management. The default rule is that management is vested in the members. A man, uh, LLC can be member managed or manager managed. Um, unless you put something in your operating agreement, the decision of the members owning more than 50% of the profits are the control. Um, Management can also be vested in managers. You can have professional managers operate or manage the LLC, or you can have some members of the LLC manage it. So you have to indicate that in the operating agreement. And of course, members and managers have the right to delegate authority to agents, employees, and if you want to call them an officer, you may. So let's see, this is how managers are chosen, and we are now at polling question number four. Thank you very much then, Tamara. Um, we were just talking about members and managers, and we have a question here on that. Polling question four, please enter your answer in the pop-up box that comes up on your screen. In your practice, are LLCs your clients operate generally, number one, member managed, or number two, manager managed? Again, this is polling question number four for CLE credit. Please answer in the pop-up box that comes up on your screen. In your practice, are the LLCs your clients operate generally, number one, member managed, or number two, manager managed? All right. Again, in the pop-up box, we'll do this one more time because I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance here. We're coming uh, near the end of the program, and you want to make sure we answer these questions and the evaluation questions upcoming. In your practice, are the LLCs your clients operate generally, number one, member managed, or number two, manager managed? All right, I think I'm going to close the poll now. I believe almost everybody answered, and Tamara, I'm pushing the results to you, and you'll see that we have uh, manager managed just beats out to member managed for 55 to 44. 
Okay. Well, that's interesting. That tells me that if you have a manager managed LLC, it's probably worth more money and it's not just something that the members wish to be involved in. So fiduciary duties are important. The Delaware LLC Act doesn't define a standard of conduct for members or managers or state whether they owe fiduciary duties. So that's, that's important to consider. The LLC has every right to indemnify and hold harmless um, any person subject to standards contained in the LLC agreement. Um, there was a 2013 amendment after a uh, Chancery Court decision, as you can see. Um, the covenant of good faith and fair dealing couldn't be eliminated. In the 2013 amendment to the code, um, the legislature said, in any case not provided for in this chapter, the rule of law and equity, including the rule of law and equity relating to fiduciary duties, um, shall govern. So this resolved the split. There had been a split between the superior and chancery courts um, over whether there was an absence of such provision, managers and members, whether they owed that fiduciary duty of loyalty. Now, if you remember what I talked about, there was a chancery court, and there's always also the court of law, and that's called the superior court, and for some reason that must have, there must have been a conflict. And if you rely on expert opinion and good faith, that should be enough. Another case that has come up is Gats Property versus Aruga Capital. Um, and in this case, this is still developing law for LLC even today. As I mentioned, the Delaware statute doesn't establish the duty of care and loyalty. So this was a case that created a split over the default fiduciary duties. That's what led to that amendment. Um, the minority members sued the manager, alleging breach of fiduciary duty, after he bought them out for a price that was well below market value. So you can see here there was a conflict between the members, and it was a manager-managed LLC. The Chancery Court held that the managers owe a default fiduciary duty of care and loyalty. The Delaware Supreme Court stated that the Chancery Court ruling that managers owe a default duty was dicta and it had no precedental value. So where there's a contractual provision imposing fiduciary duties in the operating agreement, there's no need to decide if there are default, default duties because I, I said that you know, most provisions are default and in this case they overwrote them. No party asked the Chancery Court to decide the issue and reasonable minds could differ. Um, so it was up to the General Assembly to clarify, which they did. Um, LLCs are also allowed to merge. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap this up. We've talked about a lot of information. Um, it's almost to the hour. I will just conclude with the series LLC. We get a lot of questions about that. And an LLC agreement can establish a series. So you can have an LLC that has various series that have different types of business interests, members, managers, all kinds of things like that. And in Delaware now, we have protected series and registered series. They're both interesting and important, and CT has a lot of information on that topic. So I will conclude and hand this back over to Victor. All right. Thank you so much, Tamara, for the lovely presentation today. Uh, the presentation book that Tamara has, which has additional information, will be available when we send out the thank you email. So look forward to that. Right now, though, we have a, a four evaluation questions for CLE credit. And again, please answer in the pop-up box that comes up on your screen. And the first question is, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, CLE evaluation question one, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And your choices there, obviously, you can see them, one, two, three, four, five, or five, four, three, two, one. All right, and we're going to um, go, go to another polling question. Number two is, I mean, evaluation question, it is, please rate 
today's presenter on a scale of 1 to 5, where 5 is the highest and 1 is the lowest. CLV, CLE evaluation question number 2. Please rate today's webinar on a scale of 1 to 5, where 5 is the highest and 1 is the lowest. And again, your choice is there, number 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, 5, 1. And again, just uh, answer in the pop-up box that came up on your screen. And now we're on to evaluation question number three for CLE credit. And that question is, please rate today's written materials on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And again, there are choices there, one, five, two, four, three, three. It almost sounds like a phone number. Four, two, and five, one. And again, evaluation question three, please rate today's written materials on a scale of 1 to 5, where 5 is the highest and 1 is the lowest. All right, and then we're going to do one more. And the final CLE question is, oh, one second here. It's number 4. Please rate today's webinar technology on a scale from 1 to 5, where 5 is the highest and 1 is the lowest. All right, and again, your choices are 15243342511. And again, CLE evaluation question four in the pop-up box. Please rate today's webinar technology on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And again, after answering those questions, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for our Delaware's Business Entity Laws. And we look forward to you joining us for future CLE webinars. And I believe our March 2nd one will be uh, Trust under UCC Article 9. Again, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day, evening, or morning. Thank you.